when Ian asked me to talk, I wasn't quite sure whether to talk about gold broadcasting or my own projects. And I thought, well, I'm just going to do both. So you're getting a talk in two parts. My personal journey to Gold's history and the Gold Broadcasting Association. <coughs> so I'll start with Gold Broadcasting Association and I'll give you a brief overview. I'm sure many of you are aware of Gold Broadcasting and what we do, but uh, we're a local broadcasting association that works with podcasts. We have a website, we're a community based organisation. It's free for everyone to join. Well, not free to join, it's $10 to join, but it's for the Gold community, it belongs to the community. It was organ the organisation was founded in 2014. Ian was a founding member of the committee and they're instrumental in getting it set up. The original aim was to establish a community radio station for Gawler, but we quickly found out that it probably wasn't going to be viable, partly due to the cost. It's at least 40000 to get the studio. We needed a premises that was just prohibitively expensive. And we were also told by SACFAR that we probably wouldn't get registration because they considered we are covered by Salisbury and Ross and Community Radio. So we thought we'll just do podcasting and maybe later on, you know, perhaps things will change with radio, but that's <coughs> very long term. And if so, we looked at doing podcasting, which is really the way of the future. Um, to young people, podcasting is what they listen to. And so we have two kinds of membership, individual and community groups, and it's $10 for individuals per year annually. And $30 annually for community membership. And our podcasts are subject to community radio rules, so we're still affiliated with SACBAR. And so some of our podcasts. So some of the pros and cons of podcasting. The advantages are that podcasting is flexible, so you can do, podcasts can go up at any time, you're not subject to a program like you are with radio station. You don't have to do continual input, so we had a joke at the beginning where someone said, you need to be a radio station or live stream. Is well, what are we going to do? You know, we don't have enough material for 24 7. Um, we had a joke about the goodies, and I don't know if you can remember the goodies. They had one record that they played continually when they set up their radio station. So that, that led to actually the formation of one of our podcasts. It can be done weekly, monthly, annually, or just as a run off. You can have a five minute podcast or a two hour podcast, and some I think are like 10 hours or something, Cody has often mentioned. So it can be short, long, whatever you want. But you don't require a recording studio to record a podcast and you don't require expensive equipment. So we do have um, several mics that are we loan to members. But you can record on your mobile phone. You can record anywhere. As long as there's not a lot of light noise. So just be very aware of the space that you're recording in. And a lot of echo is bad. So messy rooms are really good. Tiny rooms are not. Uh, the editing software we use is free to download. We use a program called Audacity that's free to use for <coughs> editing and we do training in that. So the big disadvantage is that you can't use copyright music or have copyright music even playing in the background. So some friends at the editor record a podcast, the radio was playing in another room and I had to try and go through and edit all of that music out of the podcast even though it was in another room and it was very faint. So they can take any form, you know, two people talking, one person talking, a group of people talking, they can be an interview, they can be a discussion, they can be more like a lecture, whatever seems to be interesting. And to talk about our website, I, about three years ago now we changed our website and changed the hosting and changed the kind of website we had to something that was a little bit more user friendly, gave us a little bit more versatility so we can offer more than just podcasting on the website um, and recently we've started to put all our podcasts up on Spotify which has made them much more accessible to people. So some of the older podcasts we recorded still haven't been moved onto Spotify as yet but that's an ongoing project that my wonderful partner has been doing for us. So we have a range of topics but there's just a million topics that can be covered as well. So <coughs> I'll talk about some of the podcasts we do in more detail. So sports podcasts, we've got two, and these were two of the first podcasts to go up on our site. Um, the Colour and Laid Sports Show and Sports Central with Rick and Phil. They go up weekly, both of them, and they cover local sports and they'll talk and give really good coverage to local sport. But they also talk about national and international. You know, 
they get into the news with sporting people and I believe they're very good. I'm not sporting myself, so I don't listen to <laughs> the gardening podcast. And again, Michelle and Trevor are local gardeners, very, very knowledgeable. And so they're talking about gardening football. They'll talk about other things, but it's very much but what when you need to plant things in Gawler because it is tailored to Gawler's conditions. So it's a really good podcast mm -hmm. on gardening. They also sell tomatoes, but I think they sold that for this year. But Trevor plants and grows organic tomatoes that they sell. It's been a wonderful fundraiser. Plus, I do civic centre news and events. So <coughs> earlier this year, I interviewed <coughs> Jacinta Bryce about the exhibition that's currently showing at the moment, and that will probably be an annual thing every time I change the exhibition, we all do a podcast about it. So that was really good because there's some extra information in there about the exhibition that's currently on. We've also been doing Civic Centre News podcast, but just people got busy, and so hopefully we'll be able to pick that up again next January when things settle down. And the Classic Hop TV Club, which is one that, uh, this is the one that's started because of the goodies reference, <laughs> joke about the goodies. We look at TV from 20 years and before, and we've been doing this from about 2017, monthly, except for the last month because people got COVID, which is really inconvenient, <laughs> not said everything, but um, we look at, you know, things like Doctor Who, Lost in Space, Batman, it's, and it's a pick. So different people in the group pick, so it's quite a variety of old TV shows, some of which. And lastly, to something getting more into history, looking back with the bunyip. Now this started a few years ago, I've always wanted to do something with the bunyip on GB8, and they had just done a deal with Brosser to discuss the news on Brosser Radio. So this was when Sarah Gilligan was editor, and she thought, about the looking back column? So I started going in and recording with Sarah, reading them, looking back and discussing the stories and trying to fill in a little bit of the background to them. And then Sarah moved on, Nick was happy for it to continue and supportive, but he didn't personally want to take part. So I didn't know who to get. And then I decided on Kay, who's a friend of mine, but Kay has a long history with Bunyip. And she actually found that dress, which is printed with the Bunyip. Uh, up in when she worked at the Bunyip many years ago, and she donated it, had it donated to the Gawler Research and Heritage Centre. But the whole dress is printed with Bunyip, and it was believed it was born for Gawler or something about 19, <coughs> 1920? It doesn't look like 1920 from the style. So we then had to find a venue, and the wonderful people in the Gawler Heritage Centre said we could record down there, so we record downstairs in the Heritage Centre once a week. and. Kay, of course, has a large knowledge of local history and passion for history. So between us, we can often add a little bit to the stories uh, printed in the bunyip. We also, of course, discuss the ball and our men photo every week. So we then we'll read the column, discuss the various stories, and talk about the ball now and then. And I've actually got um, just an example that some of the, especially the older ones, are wonderful to read aloud. So. This one, the snake was seen in the Church of England Cemetery. Perhaps some method could be adopted by the church wardens for clearing away these reptiles before they add another to the silent tenantry of the place. Um, and, and houses for writing about the weather. Up till October, the weather behaved itself with the utmost good sense. October is always a critical month, and the heat of last week end found a great many crops unable to sustain themselves. The hard-baked earth and the sturdy undergrowth and the drying winds conspired to make things look sick indeed. Unfortunately, both the last two hot spells had not had that rain behind them which atones for the scorching conditions. So very different to this year, but I love the way some of these early stories are written. They're very entertaining. We have quite fun reading them aloud. So on to the old history update. Now Barry Naylor did a talk about the old history project here a few years ago, so I don't want to talk in great detail about it, but I want to do a bit of an update. The most recent story to go up, and it's very uh, relevant right now, is Helen Hennessy talking with Patricia Booth about E.H. Coon. <coughs> so if you want a little bit of insight <laughs> before the book comes out, <laughs> then uh, have a listen to that one. So, And I've just went through and listed all the old histories that are up on the site to date, and I was impressed at how many have gone up. 
So last couple of years, due to family pressures and COVID obviously has meant that the old history boot hasn't been as active as in the past, but hopefully next year we're hoping to get that active again. And in fact, we have been asked to do old history recordings at the Aquatic Centre's anniversary on the 1st of December. So um, I went along and did a test recording there last week and I am hoping that we can, well, we will be getting a few recordings from there and there'll be people remembering their childhood at Gawler Pool and history with Gawler Pool. So there's a few more old histories coming in the pipeline really soon. And Gawler GBA has also supported and covered loads of events of the car rally that was held at Pioneer Park a few years ago as part of History Week was co-organised by GBA along with other organisations and we got a lot of old histories about cars. It was a beautiful event and we were hoping to do more History Month events but yes, history intervened. And lastly, we do an annual quiz night and that is coming up on Saturday the 3rd of December so I put some personal codes, promotional pass codes over there. It's $10 per person, be way of food and drink and uh, tables of eight. It's been a fantastic night in the past. Our quiz masters, Jerry and Eugenia, are very entertaining. They do a wonderful job. So they're looking forward to it as well. So if you're free on that night, and because it's before Christmas, we'll be giving it a bit of a Christmas theme. So hopefully we've got plans to decorate it. So it could be a good Christmas sort of event as well. So how to get involved? It's just listen to the podcast. Join up, membership is only $10 a year. Join the old history team. We really love to get more people involved in the recording and writing and recording of the old histories. There's a lot of involvement. It does require work, but it's a wonderful project and a really important project for Gawler. Become a content creator. There's quite a podcast about anything, really, whatever's of interest to you. <coughs> or just come along to our events and support us out there. Love the more members and tell other people about for broadcasting. We really appreciate it. So, with that, I'm going to move on and talk about some other personal projects of a historical nature. So, a little background I grew up in Victoria, moved to Gawler, well, went to uni at Adelaide, and in fact, the reason I didn't do honours in history was one of the subjects, there was only a few subjects offered that didn't interest me, and one of those was history of South Australia. And having grown up in Victoria, South Australia's got no history. What history? Anyway, I wrote quite a few novels of uh, mostly historical, but then we moved to Baller and I discovered that actually South Australia has a fascinating history, but I didn't realise that until I came here and I, I fell in love with Baller and Baller's history. I got really involved in Baller's history in 2004, I helped Jackie organise the Gawler Gawler Main Heritage Festival and I tried to keep the history inside of that happening to keep that historical focus in there with her. And I was involved in the Backwards and High Hills. I wrote the Lee Barron story, which when I wrote that I realised that my real passion is for social history and I wanted to write stories of people who don't normally get into the history books, the people whose names aren't known, they're the people whose history I want to find and tell. Uh, another story I focused on is my, it's actually my uncle who served during World War II at Malala Air Base. And while he was there, he was involved in a air accident, which was a horrific loss of life. And that traumatised him for the rest of his life. So I wrote and written different versions of it. I, there's a version before Sarah left, the Banyam, she published a version of it. But since then I've done a lot more research and I read it to the um, Listen at Lunch earlier this year. And so there too. But my big passion project is what I refer to as Jane and Helen's story. It's a social history and so when we moved to Gawler, we didn't know we had any family history connection to Gawler at all. My family was storytellers and they knew all my family history. Justin didn't know his family history at all because his family just weren't interested. I said, What's your family history? And he was like, yeah, we don't know. And then his sister did some research and she found this document from the left. And what really got me excited was the sold out and moved to Gawler. And I went, oh, his, his great-great-grandparents lived in Gawler. Where? 
I needed to know. So I really needed to know. So then started thinking and about the first thing I discovered was that they live just near Gore Station, about two blocks away from us. So when the children were young, they would have run through the, what were then paddocks where our house is now. So we were really living in the footsteps of Justin's ancestors. I went to Trove and a story literally fell in my lap. I've written 90,000 words and I'm hoping to use this as a PhD thesis or, and I would like to get it published. It is social history, but these people put themselves in the news continually. Thousands of entries in Trove. Not helped by the fact that the name, even though it's an unusual surname, can be spelt in many different ways. And up until I worked out 20 different spelling variations and I had to look for all of them. <laughs> so, that was a quite a task. So they came to Australia from Scotland, from Ayrshire in Scotland in 1855 and began in Boxer, which is not that cheap. But that's my grandfather's painting the same shit that I just happened to like. And I don't have one of the animal Boxer. They settled first in Smithfield, so they went pretty much first to Smithfield. And I suspect he probably had work lined up there because of the Scottish community there. And they were farming. There was a Millican Crescent in Smithfield, which has taken off the original land maps, titles. They farmed there for a few years, and then they moved out to the Rakefield River. And they moved out to the Rakefield River at the beginning of the drought. And, but back then, it was pretty much uncleared land. So they would have had to clear the land, they would have had to fence the land. They were in drought conditions and there were no resources. They would have had to go over to Port Rayfield, I think was the nearest, because this was long before Balaclava was founded. There was no township. So they were a long way from civilization. I think things went badly wrong for them there. There was no children born for a couple of years, just to indicate that <laughs> things were unhappy. They sold out and James went off to Keandra Goldfields, which were up in the Snowy Mountains. They were brutal, absolutely brutal conditions digging in the snow. Helen moved into Gawler, and this is when they moved to Gawler. So she moved in with three young children and settled in the house next to that road station. Now, it would have been a basic pug and pine cottage. It had a well, but very little else. And I don't know how long she was living there alone, or he was off in Keandra, but by the time the place was sold, it was referred to as James Milliken's cottage, but of course it was always the man that they, not the woman, even though she'd lived there a lot longer. So they then moved back to Smithfield from Gawler. So they took up farming again in Smithfield West. So Smithfield West, not the original township of Smithfield was founded by John Smith and laid out. Smithfield West was literally the Wild West. It was Red Station, the area around Smithfield Station was Smithfield West. And it was quite a different, I think, a, a much less orderly community than <laughs> Smithfield. And this is where the troubles really began. So they had land from what I, they had several blocks of land, but they were living just back as the train goes down to Smithfield Station. On the right, there's an old creek line and an old house. Now that old house is the Turner house, and their neighbours were the Turners. So I don't think that house is as old as goes back to when they lived there, but that would have been the neighbours probably built, built, rebuilt or whatever. So they were living by that creek line, just across from there station and farming. Growing wheat, fencing, fencing was a big deal. He spent about 20, I think it was 28 pound on fencing and he always ended up in a court case so he thought he was paying the father and made a deal to sell him meat because he'd also started butchering to earn him some extra money. But it turned out it was the sons and they took him to court because he didn't pay them. He was insisting it was the father he was going to pay, not the sons. So that was one of the early cases. There were so many court cases, it's just a sad thing. There must have been about, you know, I think there was three different actions in Gawler Courthouse in one day, and at one stage I think he had three different court cases in a month. Some were unpaid bills, sometimes it was him demanding money, or sometimes someone was demanding money from him. Some were neighbours disputes, a cow got into the stubble, and that was a pound of damage, <laughs> and the neighbour's cow getting into the stubble. There was fights so that. He was mining a neighbour's cow and it got impounded and the neighbour expected him to pay to get it out and he expected the neighbour to pay to get it out. So they go, they went to court. They, he spent half his life in Gawler Courthouse. So all of the Smithfield then didn't have its own doctor, didn't have its own courtroom. They always came to Gawler. So Gawler was the, the hub, the place where they came. 
I'll always report it on the bunny, and the bunny helps me through correspondence. So we get all the little news items, the juicy tidbits from what's going on in Smithfield from the Smithfield correspondent. So they also, and, uh, actually on the subject of court cases, I was going to read a few samples. So some are just hilarious. And one of my favourites is the 14-year-old boy taking the postmistress to court for defamation. So she calls him a thief and a liar. So you are very bad boys. You are a thief and thieves. You are, you are in the habit of robbing my garden. And then with 10 pounds in damages, they got one shilling. <laughs> And uh, so that was really the start. And at that stage, the neighbour actually gave evidence on their behalf. But later on, they, a lot of the court cases are against the neighbour. At one stage, he was a district constable, and it was a heat wave, and he heard noises. The neighbour obviously was drink, had friends drinking in the cellar. Cause it was, I love the story because the wife and the maid were awake and working in the kitchen. It was too hot to go to sleep, so they were bottling or something. So I assume the maid had no say in this and just had to stay up all night as well. And the men were down in the cellar drinking. So James was drunk himself and decided to go over as district constable and arrest them all. His wife tried to stop him. She was a witness in the case. And uh, he wouldn't listen to her. So he was wandering around the backyard with an axe. <laughs> I'm not sure why he had an axe. And uh, so there was a big cop case over that. And uh, the judge was not impressed and said he was acting like a village dog's body. <laughs> So, um, my favourite of all of the cases happened later, and it was not long before they left Smithfield in 1872. The, this one, Helen, the wife, gives evidence, and, and it's really lovely because you get her voice, and women's voices are so in lost in history, that she comes across as a really strong woman. So, in this case, she is a witness, and they're not actually plaintiff or defendant in this case. The neighbours have beaten some lad up who was working for a while in business to theirs. And so this is between the neighbours and William Ridgeway, whose father early happens in court against James in a battle over a bullock or something. So the Ridgeway has come up a few times. But they had beaten him up, and uh, which gives you the, the real feeling this is the wild west of Smithfield. When I was returning home after six o'clock, Turner stopped me on the main road and would not let me pass and asked what I insulted his wife for. Said I did not insult her, she insulted me. He then struck me, was carrying my books at the time. Coon then rushed at me from under Turner's veranda. Might have struck Turner after he struck me before Coombs came up. Mrs. Turner also flung stones at me and in the scuffle, my books fell and in trying to pick them up, Coombs, Coombs struck me again my hat and puggery was knocked off. Got away from them and went round another way home. To Coombs and Turner and his wife came after me until I came to Millican's fence when I went into his house for protection. And he waited there till his father and brother came. Have not seen my books, hat, neither my hat and puggery. <laughs> and the puggery is, I think, the thing that goes in the back of the hat, the cloth, to keep the flies off the side. The back of the naked. Yeah, sorry. And uh, Helen gives everyone. So that was a, one of my favourite court cases. But it's very entertaining. So, anyway, they were contracting for road building. And what the gravel, they had to be hammered down to a certain size for gravel and roads. It was a major enterprise in South Street because of the number of roads and the small population. And this went on for years. So, I could imagine all the children sitting there with a hammer, gotcha, man, you know, hammering down the stones to the correct size because there was a particular size they had to be for the roads. So they built a lot of the roads, well, gravel roads, original roads in that area. Another entertaining story from the Smithfield correspondent involves a ragging, and not that ragging, obviously, but uh, there was a lot of humour as well, and there was a um, fake auction. So there'd been some uh, various commentators of the period bemoaned the monotonous life of the settler. However laborious and dull that life in Smithfield might be, it is not without its diversions. A local correspondent, styling himself a sea servant, reports on an outbreak of practical joking in the area which may have involved the Millican boys. An unknown gent with a hundred, within a hundred mile radius of Malala, which at that stage was just a crossroads, so made enemies of his neighbours, so this could be the family, 
and uh, they retaliated with a lot of serious practical jokes, which ended up with parking a broken wagon outside the Smithfield Presbyterian Church during church service on the Sunday and set up a mock auction. Clearly not all respect of the sanctity of the Sabbath. The object of the joke auction was a broken cart belonging to Charles Witchway. One splendid spring trap, now I knew the transparent bottom was the ad. <laughs> they, so it was really the wild west of South Australia and Smithfield the rest of the time. Anyway, at the, in the later years they took up land at Kangaroo Flat. Now this is the road that leads down from the ruined chapel at Kangaroo Flat, this little chapel that's full of pigeon grotto. And their block is down on the end of that land. And there's a farmhouse there now, so I'm assuming the farmhouse would probably be on the location where the original farm was. Because they, would, they would have dug a well, and they would, so people just build over the location. So even if the original house was very basic pub and pine, the modern 70s house is probably close to the same location. So they, that's not their house, that's over the Quaddy Point, but I think it's a lovely photo, so. But it would have been a very basic house, and that probably is representative of the sort of conditions they were living in at the time. So he also took out land, and so the family went bankrupt and had to sell off their Smithfield property. So I'll just leave that up there, but I've jumped ahead slightly. So they, moved to Kangaroo Flat. Now when they went bankrupt, I've got the, this here, insolvency court. It gives a real clue to what they owned and the value of what they owned. So the assets, mortgage property value at £663, book debts considered bad and doubtful, £125, five shilling, one penny, sundries valued at £1,790. And also, around the same time, there was a sale, so I'm just going to find that, sorry, of items, which gives, a, I think, another interesting food of life at the time. Selling 18 head of horses, some good draught, other suitable for spring cart and saddle, two cows, one young bull, one heifer, 25 pigs, choice breed, reaping machine by Mallor, Interestingly, when he bought it, he wrote a letter saying how wonderful Mel's reaping machine was, which I suspect he got a discount for doing, for promoting it. Winnowing, do. One horse dray, tip do. Spring cart, bullet dray, three sets of harrows, iron cheese press, 200 gum posts, a small lot of ewes and lambs, and other sundries. So they provided lunch as well. Anyway, after they had moved to Smithfield and they leased out the Smithfield properties, they didn't actually sell them, they moved out to Kangaroo Flat. He then took up land out at a place called Sharp's Well, which is just out from Snowtown across the Moronga Range. And from what I can tell, it's right on the Goida Line. So I think this is when they started to open up beyond the Goida Line, but they managed to get land that's right on the Goida Line. There's nothing left at Sharp's Well, and the only evidence I can find of there ever having been anything were those stones there that had a bit of mortar attached to them. So there was a chapel there, there was a shop, it's all completely gone, there's nothing left. The two older sons, who are now about 18 and 19, went out and looked after this Sharp's Well property. It was only a small block, it wasn't a viable farm. Yeah, kind of we realise now that none of these blocks is early settlers were taken out were viable for farm land. They were just too small, which is why there's so many ruined stone cottages in South Australia and things like that. And bankruptcies, you know, you just go through the budget the number of bankruptcies were huge. It was so common. So the two older boys were out there living in isolation and clearing this block of land and farming it. And I imagine having an awful lot of fights. <laughs> I'd hate to think what it would be like to sort of late teenage boys farming out there. Others, they wouldn't get along. They're anything like our elders too. <laughs> wouldn't be easy. So while they were farming out there, James passed away. And he's probably one of the first burials in this cemetery. He's not in the records for that cemetery, but they start about 10 years after he died. He died in 1875. And I, I think that little cross is a little, what is it, 
cement cross that could be prescribed. So I do need to contact the cemetery and talk to them about it. But every single record we've got says he's buried there, so that's but really to do. Helen continued farming out of um, Cambridge Flat by herself. She continued to contract for road building. Though sometimes the bunnet lists her as Mr. H. Logan instead of Mrs. I really think they just didn't want to be contracting for road building. So she just carried on. She applied for men to come and grub Mally on the property and manage the property as best she could for another 10 years while the two older boys were out at Sharpswell farming. But at that time, and at that time, Helen's, the other children grew up. The youngest was only two when she was widowed. So it was incredibly challenging. But it ended up back in 1885. They went bankrupt again. And so the whole lot was sold off. <coughs> so that's the ad for the properties in Smithfield. Sold at the old Bushman Hotel in Gawler, which features right through the family history. I also imagine that after all those court cases, James would have headed over to the Bushmans for a drink to console or celebrate, depending on the result. So the eldest son, after the sale of the property at Sharp's Well, went to work at Raybourne Park, manager at Raybourne Park in Snowtown. And this is the entrance. It's an incredible property. We went there a couple of years ago. It was, it, there was nobody there but these huge galvanised iron shearing sheds. And you could just imagine that this was like a small township in its own right back in the day. It would have been absolutely booming with people. And it's all just empty and a little bit derelict. It's a bit sad. The other brother went off to gold fields in, um, uh, out sort of towards Broken Hill on that road and found a nugget of gold, which he donated or something. And it's put on display at the museum in South Australia. And Helen, after selling up, at Cambridge, moved down to Port Adelaide, where she opened up a wine shop. And for many years, she ran a wine shop in Port Adelaide, while her sons were preaching about the evils of alcohol, oh, tea tablets. <laughs> and so I really wonder how that... So they moved down there as well, and carried on preaching about tea total and tea total, tea total, tea total. So she was an incredibly enterprising woman and it comes across as this really strong woman that right through and in some of the court cases that the judge speaks very respectfully of Helen. So I think it's really interesting to be able to find the woman in the story as well because women don't get into the story, they don't get noticed, they get overlooked and they get written out. So I, my social history of this family ends with talking about, finishes with the first generation of children are just pretty <laughs> so, uh, we don't have any photos of them. These are the sons in the top row and next generation, next two generations. So I tried to do a compilation of whatever photos I've found. It's, it's really sad that I've got no photos of these people. I've spent so much time. I feel like I know them. I feel like they're people that's so real to me, but I don't know what they look like. So, so having done all that, I've decided to do a little bit of my own family history and Possibly write it up as a social history, or just even just if it's, I end up just doing my own family for the sake of the next generations. But my family are complete opposite of Justin's. They're storytellers. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with the stories about my great great grandparents coming out to the gold fields in Ballarat, pushing a wheelbarrow up from the coast from the sailing ship, living in a tent on the gold fields. And there's a story of my great great grandparents, they were living in a tent. She lost his first grade. She got a job and she lost his first grade so he was there in the hospital. And about a week later, a man came running up to the tent and said, quick, quick, miss, you know, go and tell your husband. The gold seems changed directions, heading straight for your tent. You need to peg that land out right away. So she ran across the gold fields to tell him and turned around and said, you're daft, woman, you're daft. <laughs> they missed out their chance to find gold. And that's a story that they would then recount to the, their grandson and it came down to me. So this is, that was my grandparents' house we grew up next door to. So I had this history all around me. We had gold um, mines opening up in our back, almost in our backyard, just across the fence. And I went to the same primary school that my grandmother had gone to. So I grew up surrounded by history. History was part of my life. Growing up in Ballarat, you, you can't really avoid it. I did volunteer work at Sovereign Hall for quite a while as well. And I used to walk around Ballarat in a costume. <laughs> 
We also fortunate that we have these letters. So this one is from my great-great-grandfather to my great-great-grandmother, written in 1905 when she was ill. They survived a house fire, so they were in a little drawer in the back of a kitchen dresser. He was a joiner and he made the dresser. The house was gutted by fire and the drawer was hidden in the back and the letters survived and a lot of them were water stained and smoke stained. But we're really fortunate, so we've got about 20 or so of these letters from early 20th century from various family members. And a lot of photos. This is actually my dad's side, this one. But. So, I will leave it with that and say thank you very much for listening. And, um, <laughs>
on the fact that we recently did a training session with the police um, sector. Mm -hmm. yes, etc. Mm -hmm. so, which was good because it helped us get our training skills up to Spectra had done the training for a little while, but we also do one-on-one -on -one training. So we've Marilyn and Jerry were doing training sessions, but then we found it was just easier to do one-on-one -on -one training or with small groups because trying to get lots of people saying, oh, I can't do that night, I can't do that night, so it's, uh, so yes. That sounds interesting. But just to be with the call of oral history, how does that actually found in your organisation? Well... Did you subsume them or are they like... Totally no, different? no, Barry... So Barry was one of our founding members and not oh, our okay. committee. And he decided, as part of GBA, under, so it's under the banner of GBA, to set up the old history thing. But he set it up as a semi autonomous, but it's only semi autonomous, but it's still under the GBA oh, banner. It's still under the GBA. Yes, so okay. it's covered by our, our sort of constitution, our public liability goes up on our website. It's a part of GBA, so it's just a, like a branch, a sub branch of GBA, I suppose. Yeah. 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 And it's been a very big, major part of GBA, really. It's really important. So. Have been many people volunteering to talk about their life stories, though? Because it can be quite intimidating for a lot of people to um, sit there and go through. I think, and I've got, I know of a few people I'd love to interview. It's more just time. Yeah. It's actually getting the time to do it. I think there's a lot of people that we could talk to. So I think the, sh the problem isn't in finding people to talk to with interesting stories. It's finding the time to, to do the recording, to process, because it is quite a process. Okay, like Ian tonight, he does another three or three hours on top of tonight to That's right, yeah. do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, with every podcast I record, I spend, I think, at least three times as long editing and okay. processing. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a time commitment, which is, the, which is one, probably the biggest disadvantage of podcasting, is that it does require time to yeah. do the editing and the post-production. But the, the advantage is that it's not, you're not forced to learn it all live the way that exactly. community radio, for example, yes. they just mm. put you there live and yeah. say, study your way through it. Yeah. So and you yeah, you can make it as uh, people repeat or start or you know, something will happen in the background and if we're recording at our house, the cat will come in or somebody else will walk in and start making themselves a cup of tea. And we just wait. And I edit all that out. So, and I really find that when I'm editing, so like the COP TV COD ones, there's six of us. And the first time I listen to it, I think, oh, it's not that good. And by the time I've ed I edit that one twice, usually, by the time we get to the second edit, I think, oh, this is fantastic. It's so, makes such a difference when you get rid of those things. Because when you're talking to people, you don't notice those sort of speech things. But when you're listening to them and you don't have all the other cues to distract you, you really notice all the little things that you don't you to talk to people. So, yeah, the editing really makes a big difference to what you finally put up. But it, it's wonderful, like we record down in the Heritage Centre, people will come in and out while we're recording. So it's like, okay, it's fine, just, yeah, you know, I'll edit that out, it's not a problem. You don't have to stress about somebody coming in. So it means that you can record, that we are recording in a place where there are people moving around, working, doing things, and it's not actually a problem. So it's much easier than radio in that regard too. What's the criteria for people that you want to record though? For the old history? Well, there's so many, yeah, there's so many people and so many stories, so you must have some boundaries where you focus or... You um, we try to, to keep it Gawler. Well, it doesn't have to be specifically Gawler, so it could be... There has to be a connection to Gawler. Oh. But whether, like uh, one of the early ones was uh, Jack, a young guy that... He went off to China, it was about his trip to China, but he was a Gawler person. So that was the connections. It doesn't have to be about something that happens in Gawler. Oh, okay. So it's very broad. Yeah. It's a very broad. So it's just a Gawler connect somewhere in there. Yes, yeah. yeah. This has to be a Gawler connect somewhere in there. That's it. So just maybe someone who lives in Gawler or even someone that just passed through Gawler. It doesn't have to be. We're not strict enough. Okay, well thank you very much. I will now ask young Cody to come forward for a vote of thanks. Yeah, so I've 
known Jeanette ever since that first, yes, yes. ever since that first meeting when you know it was, uh, you know, are we going to create our own radio station? And yes, yeah. sadly, the answer was no. But, uh, but I think we've done something wonderful. But we've done, yes. uh, we've done something that I think is going to make a huge impact on yes. yeah. um, on Gola, yeah. um, because oral history in particular, the work mm -hmm. that. That's fantastic. The work that's done in oral history is something that just ordinary people's stories is what you don't get exactly. out of the stories from yes. hundreds of years ago. You find out about the pioneers, but you don't find out what did the average person do in their day. So I think it's a very important project, and Jeanette's been doing a lot of work um, over the past eight years now. On ten, ten no, years. Yeah, um, 2014. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so eight years. Eight years. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, thank you for all your work.